So we have Jeffrey Klausner, a clinical professor of public health science at Keck School of Medicine, USC. David France, a journalist and the director of How to Su Survive a Pandemic. Ngoze Ezike, who we just heard about, former director of the Illinois Department of Public Health. And Anne Ramoyne, epidemiology professor at UCLA Geffen School of Medicine. So I wanted to start off asking David, what sort of story did you think you were going to tell when you started? Because you started filming in April of 2020. Mm -hmm. So what did you envision? Did you have a vision for what you thought was you were going to be reporting on or showing us? Well, I knew I wanted to report on the vaccines. It, was, it had become my fixation. It was what I was um, dreaming about and calling people up to gossip about uh, daily, to, um, to guess about what was happening. Um, John Cohen was a colleague of mine. I knew if anybody knew what was going on in that world, it would be him. So I had him on the phone. Um, and ultimately, we thought, if we're going to spend this kind of time, we might as well try to produce something productive <laughs> out of it. Um, but I thought, actually, what we would be finding is uh, the role of kind of um, ordinary citizens interacting with science in a way that would be synergetic, um, synergistic. And, um, and I thought that because that's what had happened in the AIDS pandemic. Mm. So we began looking for that kind of activism. And what we discovered in really early on was that the activism was coming from the, the bench, from the scientists themselves, and that so many of them had spent so much time in AIDS and HIV that they had really learned the lessons that, um, that were kind of forged in, in AIDS and AIDS activism decades earlier, and they brought it to bear in this fight. So that was, that was kind of a surprise to us that we, that we were really seeing a kind of a radical dedication on the part of so many scientists. Mm -hmm. And you're really able to kind of lift the veil and show these really intimate moments with Dr. Fauci and Dr. Peter Marks. And when I was watching it, I remember thinking that it seems like if you were to watch this, it would be sort of difficult not to believe that vaccines work because it's so gen like it's completely different than just hearing public health officials say you should get vaccinated. It's you can see that these people are so invested in it, they're so excited about it. And so for the non-journalists, I'm curious how the pandemic has sort of changed the, how you see the role of science communication and media, both media like this and also you know, journalism, because it feels like you know, if everyone watched this movie, maybe there would be less vaccine hesitancy. And I'll open that up. First of all, Maggie, thank you so much. You're very kind. Um, and I'm going to have to call my therapist because I'm just seriously having all kinds <laughs> of flashbacks. Um, no, but communication has been the number one issue. Um, when I walked into the Department of Public Health, we had like one person that did comms. Uh, and just because of COVID, we, that one turned into like having to have a team of like 15. It was all about communication. And it wasn't just figuring out what to say. It was what languages does it have to be set in, and it was who needs to deliver the message in different communities. You know, in a state of you know 12.7 million, rural, urban, suburban, like it's not a one size fits all message, and people are coming with very different needs, very different concerns. Uh, whether you're uh, a migrant farm worker or you're an undocumented immigrant or you're uh, an African-American that has all these uh, issues, especially Tuskegee came up all the time, uh, whether you're on a certain side of the political spectrum, like there were just so many populations and subpopulations that needed uh, to be addressed and you had to understand where people were. Uh, and so it needed to be a very local and focal response. And that in itself was a, a more than a full-time job for quite a few people, not just at the health departments, the local health departments, but all the community-based organizations. You saw how aggressive that uh, pastor, that person, uh, that ministerial leader had to be, like being like the organizer for the community. And we had hundreds of events at churches, whether it's black churches or uh, Spanish-speaking churches, synagogues, mosques, 
uh, Vietnamese Buddhist temples, like all of that was a part of the solution. Does anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, well, I think, I think one of the uh, challenges is, I mean, it's not just about talking, it's about listening. And, you know, what struck me in the film, what was the, you know, outreach workers and outreach worker leadership, and, you know, you didn't really necessarily highlight, you know, the, the pushback maybe from the people who were vaccine hesitant or weren't ready to be vaccinated. You just highlighted, you know, that, that they were listening. And okay, well, here's some information. You're not ready for it right now. We understand your concerns. So they were, you know, clearly, um, you know, empathetic to their hesitancy. And I think that that's been a gap, I think in many places is just the ability to listen and understand people's concerns and really try to meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about the final, or uh, Dr. Wynn, did you want to add something? Well, I mean, I, I, I think that I, I agree with what everybody has said here, but I think that the thing that this, this issue of vaccine hesitancy, you know, we're doing a lot of studies on vaccine hesitancy at the School of Public Health at UCLA and everywhere else we're all doing this, I think has just taken everybody by such surprise to think that this has become, you know, the, the number one issue uh, standing in the way of, of being able to, to, to move forward in so many ways. And I, I just really think that this film did such an amazing job of really watching this, this, this wave sort of start to, to, to gain momentum and to, you know, I crest, uh, you know, in, in such an important way. When we talk about vaccine hesitancy, are there lessons that we've learned from the rollout of the COVID vaccines that have, uh, that can help us with other vaccines, like are from the, the research and the the way you're changing the communication. Um, are there things that we know now about what works, what helps convince people that we didn't know before? Well, uh, what, what, what I uh, read last week was interesting. There was a study where, where, where they took um, Donald Trump's initial communications about the success of the vaccine. And he and Milana had just gotten vaccinated and he was, you know, brimming about the greatest vaccine in the world and he had made this great vaccine and everyone needs to take this great vaccine. And they took those clips, this is in the past few weeks, and they repackaged those clips and they've played them in, you know, some of the redder parts and some of the redder counties in the country and they actually saw a, a substantial uptake in, uh, in vaccination oh, wow. as a relation of that campaign. So, I mean, someone finally had that brilliant idea to take those words and take that individual. And it, it does, you know, remind you that the, you know, messenger matters. Mm -hmm. But Jeff, you know, you and I have both worked on uh, clinical studies of vaccines in low resource settings for, for decades. Jeff and I have known each other for a good uh, 15, plus years, and I do a lot of work in Congo, and it's been very interesting to me to see that these same issues that we're talking about as new issues, in many ways, are the same issues that we have dealt with for decades, just with vaccine-preventable diseases in, in places like Congo. Um, and, and I think that, that that's one of these things that, that I, I fear that we keep going down the same road. We never learn the lessons that we need to learn. I mean, every single time, and we see this even with the Ebola outbreaks that we've experienced over and over again in DRC, we think, okay, well, this time it's going to be different. This time it's gonna be different. But the problems are always the same problems. They're a little bit different of a flavor. We now have social media um, in a way, working in a way that we had not been um, you know, dealing with before. And uh, you know it, th there are different types of social media, you know, and the, the, you know that that might be the difference. But but I think fundamentally this issue is the same issue um, that we see over and over again. So I, I think while we're seeing we're ex we are experiencing it here now, you know, polio eradication campaigns, we have the same problems there that we've always had with this. It's always coming down to the messaging and who the messenger is. And it, obviously it wasn't, uh, like you said, a new problem. Um, and, and the different communities that have the lowest vaccination rates have been consistently the same and we have not come up with a new message. So, you know, flu shots every year, it's always the African-American populations that are the very lowest. And I remember when I was in clinical practice, every flu season, you know, people with asthma, people with heart disease, all the people that absolutely need it, get, oh no, I don't do that. We, uh, my family doesn't do it. Like, it's not a 
trait in a family, <laughs> but you know, my, my family doesn't do flu shots, you know? Uh, and so the fact that we've never gotten over that hump just set the groundwork for a bad situation to now have arguably, very fairly you can say like, there was gonna be a problem with this because everyone was saying like, oh, it takes five years. So wh what do you mean 11 months? You said it takes five years. So something must have, I mean, it's too good to be true. Some corners must have been cut. And then of course, you know, the experiments were just happening. We were calling it experimental vaccine, experimental vaccine. It's like, no, 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 it's not experimental anymore. Now <laughs> it's authorized, you can take it. Like, of course there was gonna be, I mean, people were already having problems with vaccines that have been around for, for decades, century. Um, when I came into my role, people, we had measles outbreaks in Illinois because people didn't want to take the measles vaccine and we've known about measles for centuries. So uh, clearly like we have a lot of work to do with specifically vaccine literacy as part of health literacy generally. And that's gonna be a fundamental that needs to be addressed if we're going to get past and really get to serious health because we can't keep trying to take care of things. You know, I won't take the vaccine, but I'll take this monoclonal antibody or this medicine that has a million side effects and really can kill you. Um, and, and we know it can change your DNA and cause mutations and maybe cancer, but I, I'll, I'll take medicines, but I won't take vaccines. So there's just a lot of baseline health literacy, vaccine literacy that really needs to be pushed on. I kept saying, we need to start with our little kindergartners and our preschoolers and start talking about, you know, show uh, kids, you know, explain what polio was for the US. We don't really see that. S explain what polio was. Say why we don't see little kids double dutching, you know, jump roping with braces on their legs because when you go to the doctor, even though you hate it, you get those shots, but that's why you don't have polio. Like the, the vaccines have done themselves in by being so effective. And so we need to bring that back, what exactly they've done so people can appreciate them. Uh, if I could add, this is exactly why I wanted to make this film because I saw what you all were struggling with. And, and I thought that, that it's, it's actually, it is mysteriously transparent what's happening. Um, we don't know what's going on behind those curtains in those laboratories. Um, I, I don't understand how people thought Bill Gates got back there with his little chips. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I don't know how those leaps were made, but I, I do know that, uh, that we needed to see it. And, I, and, um, and, then, and hopefully in seeing it, it demystifies it in some way. And that's why I think, if I could just throw this back to Sloan, that's why I think that the work that Sloan does in trying to open up science to everybody's eyes is so essential. And I'm hoping, and we had a conversation up here in the corner, I'm hoping that, that stories like this might be able to convince people who are still hesitant about um, the vaccine to see that it's just people who are doing this work and doing it for all the right moral and ethical reasons. Right, I think, I mean, you know, one, one of the challenges is our absence of, you know, scientific literacy, right? So people can name multiple menu items on, you know, at, at McDonald's, right? But they can't name one immune cell. And, you know, we've done a terrible job in our country with, you know, emphasis on STEM education. So, you know, other countries that have had much better uptake when they've had vaccine have, have a population that understands, you know, how vaccines work. And I can't blame people for, you know, saying, okay, I'm not gonna have something jabbed in my arm if I have no idea what it does, how it works. And, you know, microchips, of course, are ridiculous to educated people, but, you know, a lot of our population have very low amounts of education. And so I feel like we blame ourselves for that, you know, failure to have the right framework and the right, you know, vulnerability to receive the message. And yet this is global, right? I mean, it's all through Europe, all through Asia, through populations with sophisticated STEM education. The, there's just something about this process that freaked people out on top of what their fundamental lack of knowledge or suspicions were. Of course, you have to appreciate that, you know, this is coming on the foundation of a pandemic that was just rocked everybody to the core. Right. Right. So they were, were just not in our normal mental state. Like we have all lived through this mass casualty post-traumatic event that we're still, you know, that's not just a single day, but two and a half years. And so, you know, 
I think all of our thinking was has just been a, affected by that, and so maybe you know if it you know if it was just like oh there's this new thing you need to take it, but it wasn't on the backdrop of where you had this period where you're like are we going to live or die? I've seen mother, father, I've lost my job, I've lost my livelihood, blah blah blah. Like all of that played into maybe some of the reactions that we've seen. Mm. I mean, I, I think that, that we, this is, again, something that we see in places like Congo all the time. When you see, when you're having these kind of mass traumatic events that are affecting everybody, that, you know, a, a, a pandemic, an epidemic, epidemics are inherently political. And they're inherently, they inherently cause um, fear and, um, you know, distrust and, and all of these things. So the, all of these things layered on top of the, the lack of scientific literacy, the, the, you know, the poor understanding of public health in general, the fact that when we have a win with public health, it, it, it goes unnoticed. It, you know, that's, that's just standard practice, that it, it makes people very distrustful of a, of a system. And so I, I, you know, I, I think there was no way that this wasn't going to, to happen um, to a certain degree. I just think it, it really took all of us by surprise how, how deep the division was and how much of a of an issue it was going to be across the board but if we really looked as you said i mean you talk about measles as a perfect example you know this was a this was an, an undercurrent that that existed and and um, you know i i feel that we in in science and in public health in particular tend not to learn the lessons that that um, have already been been taught to us you know whether, whether it's optimism or you know, hope for the future. You know, people in public health tend to be pretty optimistic about what's going to, you know, where things are going, um, and and have a lot of hope for the future. Um, but but I think we do really need to go back and take a very strong, you know, serious look at what's happened before and realize it's very likely going to happen again, and that we have to be taking these lessons from what's happened in the past and not say, well, it's different this time because it's it's not. Um, David, I wonder if you could talk about, to me, the film feels as though it's, it's sort of in two chapters. The first one feels like the triumph of the vaccines, and the second one is the sort of tragedy of the way that they were distributed. Um, and I wonder sort of if you could talk about why you structured it that way, and also that, that final fact that we get about how one million lives could have been saved uh, if the vaccines were distributed more equitably. Uh, well, it was... You know, it's important for me to understand right from the very beginning that, and Peter Marx talks about it, that a vaccine is no good if it just sits in a warehouse someplace. That um, the only way to measure the efficacy of a vaccine is by getting it out and, 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 and putting it to work. Um, so we were uh, dedicated to that so-called last mile analysis, and we picked as, um, as, as our measurement period that first full year of vaccine availability, uh, which was 2021. That was the year also that COVAX, through the World Health Organization, had set up its own goals to vaccinate 20% of the, of the population of every country. Um, and that that 20% would have allowed for the vaccination of the high-risk categories, the elderly, the people with comorbidities, um, and, and, uh, and all the healthcare workers. So kind of standard across the, uh, the globe. And in order to do that, you had to keep com countries from hoarding and, and uh, companies from price gouging and the like. So that's what we were looking for, to, to see whether or not that one simple goal or seemingly simple goal was addressed and met. Um, and that did divide the film into two parts. And you know, I, there's only one review that I bristle at, and it's the one that said that we should have just stopped and celebrated the, the vaccines. Like, there was such good news. Why was I such a downer about this? Um, but, <laughs> right? Right? So, um, and, which means I think they turned the thing off because they didn't see why I was such a downer about it to, to look at the second half. But, um, so yeah, so that's, that's the goal that we had in mind was, was to do that. And um, I, did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask for our public health experts, I mean, obviously one million uh, deaths that could have been averted is a very big deal, but there are other consequences of the ways that the vaccines have been distributed. Even for us in the US going forward, it means more variants. I'm just wondering if any of you would sort of touch on some of those other public health effects of the way that the vaccines have sort of been spread around the world. 
in terms of you know the next couple of years of the pandemic. Well, I mean, you've just you've just hit on the on the key ones that that we already worry about, which is the development of new variants. I mean, that if you don't have the you know enough of the world vaccinated, you're going to continue to see the virus spread. I mean, this is the the mantra that we always talk about. You know, is going to have more cases. You're going to give the virus more opportunity to to replicate. If it replicates, it mutates, and eventually, you can end up with some variants. And and I think that that. You know, we, we spend a lot of time trying to reassure ourselves. This goes back to, again, it's going to be fine. It's going to be less severe, you know, all of these other things that, that we really have no idea what's going to happen. Um, also, the delay in getting those vaccines to low resource settings in particular exacerbated the vaccine hesitancy in those places. It made it even harder to get the vaccine out. Mm -hmm. And that damage has already been done. It's very, very difficult to undo that kind of damage. So I think that that, that delay has had a, a, you know, very long echo um, into the into the future in terms of, of what that means. So, you know, the, the delay of the vaccine just means that we live with this virus longer impacting our lives in, in every way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's complicated because um, the immunity one uh, acquires after re recovery from infection uh, seems to be not exactly the same as the immunity one gets from uh, vaccination, and there's still a lot of unknowns in terms of you know durability. So if you look at some country populations that you know unfortunately have you know suffered massive um, epidemics, and now their population is you know 70, 80 percent recovered, those who have survived the pandemic. Um, it's different than a population like New Zealand where they've had, you know, few actual uh, in infections relatively, but high rates of vaccination. So, you know, I, I, I don't think we really know the, you know, differential kind of impact, but we do know that the more continued spread, the more opportunity for, you know, emerging variants. It's entered into, you know, large animal reservoirs, you know, huge rodent populations, feline populations. So, it's not going away from planet Earth, and it's you know circulating in these large animal reservoirs. So there's going to be continued interactions between humans and other animals, and uh, you know whether it becomes fully like influenza with such you know repeated ongoing bouts of severity, or if it just becomes like the other human human coronaviruses, common colds that people get on an ongoing recurrent basis. They get sick if they're very immune suppressed or elderly uh, from it. Um, I think there's a lot we just don't know. Jeff, I think that what you just said, the last thing you said is the most important thing, which is there's a lot that we just don't know. And we're always trying to make it sound like, well, it could be just like influenza or it could be just like these other viruses. But the fact is, is that this virus is very different than, than other viruses that we've seen in the past. And we don't really know what's going to happen. And in particular, as you say, you know, we, we know that there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of animal reservoir uh, the reservoirs that exist, and we know when viruses bounce back and forth between uh, animals and humans that you know it, it's it's anybody's guess that could happen. It's a it's a coin toss where this could go, you know. I and I think that I think that that's something that's very hard to communicate, and this goes back to health communication and trying to get because people always want assurance as to what's going to happen next. You know, they want to be able to read the last chapter of the book. I, I like to read the last <laughs> chapter of the book. I'm not somebody that wants the suspense. I don't like the suspense. I'm always asking my husband, well, what's next? Like, just tell me how. How it ends. I just want to know. But we don't know. We have no idea how this is going to end if, or if it is going to end or in what way it's going to end. And I think that that causes so much confusion and contention um, because it makes people inherently uncomfortable. Everybody, the, the scientists, public health specialists, the general public, it makes everybody uncomfortable. Especially in this day and age where you're supposed to be able to Google everything and get the answer, right? right? right. And so, it, you know, we did thousands of town halls where we just wanted people like sh share your thoughts tell me your questions let's 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 dig into it and so many questions well what exactly will happen after i've had this vaccine for 5 years i was like nobody's had it for 5 years you will be able to tell me what happens after 5 years and that's so discomforting to people because people want definitive answers and so understanding the scientific process and understanding that the reason that you have things in the in the science books that are just definitive is because somebody else, you know, lived through it. And now you are living through it. And the, his, you know, the science books in, in 20 and 30 and 40 years will talk about what they've seen in you. But people are like, no, no, but that makes me a guinea pig. Well, exactly. you're just part of the scientific process. And that's not comfortable for many people because 
they never really thought about how the science, you know, you just, they're actually watching the sausage being made <laughs> and it looks not so smooth as just eating the food and saying, yeah, I love it, as opposed, you know, being part of it, so. But that's, mm -hmm. that's the key, is that we're, they're watching, people are watching science unfold. And f scientists understand that there's inherent uncertainty in the work that they're doing and that things can always change and that there's, you know, a need to be able to pivot or to, you know, reformulate your hypotheses. And uh, this goes back to, you know, Jeff's comment about scientific literacy. And, but it's exactly this issue. Well, what happens in five years or what happens if you've had COVID? I mean, nobody knows except we're starting to see the data that show, you know, that the, the effects of having COVID are, are, you know, not necessarily great, that there may be some sort of hybrid immunity to, to your point, but, you know, you may be more susceptible to blood clots. You may have, there, there may be very long-term sequelae. And I think we really do understand now that there are long-term sequelae to, uh, in, you know, to infections uh, from viruses. I mean, we think about what we've just learned about um, Epstein-Barr and, and uh, um, MS, right? I mean, there, there are a lot of things that I think we just don't know, and that just goes, you know, there, there are a lot of unknown, there are a lot of known knowns, a lot of unknown, uh, you know, known unknowns, but there are a lot of unknown unknowns here, so. Um, on that note, I think we're gonna open it up for questions, if anyone wants to ask, yes. Um, well, I couldn't run. No, just kidding. But no, no. I mean, the truth is, we, you know, we are just. You can't unring the bell. You can't put the genie back in the box. So some of the things that we now, that are now the quote new norm, we have to deal with. So we know that everyone wants to know everything, right? Like they want to. What are the numbers today? What does that mean? Everyone is an armchair epidemiologist. Everybody is now an expert in vaccine development, right? So we need more storytellers because that will help, you know? So as people are, quote, you know, doing their research and, and, and learning everything, if we can have factual science-based uh, information in the form of movies or, or series that people can actually get good information, that's probably a best, you know, we know people want to binge watch series, uh, you know, on, on Netflix or Hulu. So if we can have that or, programming. Or H HBO. HBO, sorry. HBO, absolutely. HBO. Uh, then we absolutely need to, to use that, that, that platform since we know that people will avail themselves of it. And if it's the right information, we have a really big opportunity there. So that, that, that's one way. And then just making sure that we are, like, filling in some of those gaps. In, in the education that people don't have that leads them astray. I mean, I, I think your question was, what's different in 2022 than 2020? Uh, sure. Um, so, I mean, you know, certainly, you know, in, in, in 2020, we didn't have vaccines. We didn't really have good surveillance and monitoring uh, programs. We didn't have treatment. And, um, you know, so I think we have different tools now we had very few in 2020, and that's why, you know, most places took this precautionary, you know, approach with, you know, capacity limits and closures and, you know, home confinement and, you know, different kind of efforts. So, so as the pandemic changes, which, which happens in public health, as, you, as things change, you have different tools and your strategies uh, get updated. So um, right now, probably many you heard there, you know, one of the key strategies is, is this test to treat strategy. So that, you know, people who are at risk for hospitalizations, who are, you know, immunocompromised or elderly, have other chronic conditions, get, make sure they know about treatment. And, you know, the availability of treatment, which is now still a big challenge, like vaccines were in the United States. Uh, you can't just easily prescribe to a CVS or Walgreens uh, and expect that CVS or Walgreens to have the medication available, but it's slowly getting there. But there, so, so that's, so we're in a different phase, I think, in terms of our strategies, more focusing on treatment and trying to prevent hospitalizations as opposed to trying to do everything we can to prevent infection. I think the organizers here did, you know, pretty much as much as they could 
to prevent the spread of infection, which is great with the masking and some attempts at, dis at distancing, the outdoor events, the you know testing multiple times. But you know we're we're going to be heading toward a more focus on on treatment and making people aware of treatment and uh, getting treatment early. So I think that's a big difference. I would I would argue that maybe surveillance was getting really good for a period of time, but we're literally dismantling all of the surveillance systems that we have um, in place at this time with a focus, because I think everybody always wants to have that one thing that's gonna work. What's the one thing that's gonna work right now? Oh, it's gonna be test to treat. That's gonna be the thing that's gonna save everybody, but it's not the one thing that's gonna save everybody. You have to be firing on all cylinders at all times if we wanna get in front of this. You know, we've, the, with the, with the, you know, the, the lack of information on, on, on the the cases and the the you know the, the sequencing is now going to start going. Well, you know we're going to lose all of our situational awareness. So we're already going to be like in the soup by the time we really understand what's going on. And I think that the the reality of it is is that the treatment is. I mean, it's we have to absolutely have treatment. We absolutely have to have that. But the the capacity of hospitals has not been improved. I mean, if we have end up with a bad flu season plus COVID, we're still going to be screwed. You know, I mean, we already. We, there are so many different things that still need to be done to be able to be in front of, of a pandemic, and, and we're not there. You know, we're always looking for the one thing. There's not one thing. There are about 10 things that we have to be doing if we're going to be able to get back to normal, if we're going to be able to protect the vulnerable, if we're going to be able to have people choose, you know, I don't want to get infected. So I'm not going to, you know, I, I'd rather do, I'd rather not get it as opposed to have to rely on getting treatment to be able to, to, to get onto the other side of it because there's no guarantee that you're not going to have some sort of long-term consequence of it. So definitely that multi-pronged approach is, is key, but vaccination is still, is still the main thing. Like when every, I mean, I monitor the numbers every single, like almost hourly, all like 90 plus percent of the people that were being hospitalized were people who were not vaccinated. It's that simple. Every single month we, we ran the data. Okay, what is it now for this week? What is, that, what is it for the month of October, November, December? The same, 90 plus percent of the people that were admitted to the hospital were not vaccinated. And so even though we had, like Illinois had one of the highest vaccination rates, you know, out of 12.7 million, eight, nine million people vaccinated, but you, if you have three million people that are not vaccinated and therefore susceptible, like we were at our breaking point with having 6,800 COVID patients in the hospital at one time. 6,800 just COVID patients almost broke our system in terms of filling up all the hospital beds in the state. And with three million unvaccinated people, like, I mean, just imagine, like there are still too many people unvaccinated that if a significant surge, God forbid, one that doesn't care about the vaccine that we did get that says, yeah, I've changed enough that I don't respect your vaccine either. So you're, it's back to 12.7 million. Like then, you know, we're screwed? Is that a That's public health term? We're screwed? That is, that is the appropriate public health term. <laughs> well, one thing that's changed but hasn't changed at all is messaging. I mean, we were talking about how awful it was at the very beginning. Um, and, and, and congratulations to everybody here who voted. We did change the government. But the messaging, the, the consistency of the message hasn't arrived. And that's been really disappointing to see that we, you know, the, the CDC is out of pace with the state departments of health, which are, is out of pace sometimes with the NIH. And, um, and you know, so who's giving us the messages? Who's, con who, and the, the fact of that, that chaos continuing, um, uh, f feeds this uh, the the uh, the anti-vax hesitancy, and it's it, it's we haven't solved that problem yet of messaging, and that would seem to be simple. At least in the new administration, it would seem to have been simple, but it hasn't been. It's hard to have it be. I'm oh, sorry. Go, no, go, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I have such strong feelings about that. Go ahead. Well, I mean, my my short answer is just that we, you know, there isn't even consensus on the in you know in the scientific community or between the the scientists at, at CDC or NIH or, or elsewhere. And so I think it's been very very complicated. But you're absolutely right. The messaging is 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 critical, and it's continuing to be a problem. I'm really interested. Yeah, in what I you mean, I mean, there's this circular firing squad, if you will, because everybody's under duress, everybody's under the gun, maybe because of their boss, whether it's a politician or, or whoever, 
where, you know, you can't, the state health officials, you know, the departments of public health for the different states are all trying not to go it alone and just say, Illinois is going to do this. And so they want the, the federal uh, entity to kind of set some standards from the top and so that we're all on the same page or else you have the situation where I was in for two years where I was taking the most conservative approach of all the states in the Midwest and all the neighboring states are doing everything else and they're like, well, what do you know that Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, Iowa don't know that we can't do this and they're doing that, right? And so then you're saying, CDC, we want some guidance out now and in the absence of them putting out the guidance, every state is putting out their own. But CDC is this public health agency that wants to be super methodical, super intentional, wait till it's abundantly clear, not just say, we think this looks good, let's go for it. And so I understand why it always took them so long, but in the midst of the fire, uh, nobody's waiting for that and nobody's comfortable with the, I've got to do this methodically because we don't want to have to reverse ourselves because that would be a problem too. And so it, it was like, a, it's a setup where it's not about people not messaging well, it's that people are not comfortable with understanding that, you know, you can't just take one study and say, oh, I have the answer, right? You're taking all, I mean, everybody, our scientific community has been amazing at putting out an abundance of, you know, everybody's putting out the publications and preprints from all around the world and you're trying to amass all of that to figure out where, where does the conclusion lie in there? Uh, and so being able to have the answer right away that everybody can run with, it, it's not there. It's not there. So it's, I'm not sure if it's communicating poorly as it's trying to really let the dust settle and that takes time. I, uh, David, so uh, it was kind of interesting that CDC was pretty absent from your film, right? I mean, you had a deep dive with FDA and Peter Marks. You had, a, you, had you know, Tony Fauci, NIH. You had a couple, you know, White House scenes there. Where was the CDC? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and as a former CDC employee, I mean, it speaks to what the CDC can and can't do. And, the, you know, as you said, the CDC is a, sees itself a, a, as like the definitive public health science organization. They like to do retrospective, look back studies. They take, you know, months and months to, you know, publish something. It's very carefully wordsmith, but they're not a, a, a pandemic response agency. And we don't, and we somewhat had a pandemic response agency, but that, you know, Office of Pandemic uh, Preparedness and Planning, that got shut down. And people By were Trump. Yeah. sent home. Right. And uh, so we were, you know, left to face this disaster without a response unit. Well, tr absolutely true. Um, uh, but in all of my years of watching the CDC, I've never seen leadership like Robert Redfield. And like, it was a surprise pre-pandemic to put him in, and then a disaster during the pandemic to have him there. Here's a guy who, you know, just didn't have that epidemiological background. He, he wasn't, he didn't have the training. He didn't have the respect. He came to Donald Trump through kind of like Christian right circles, which is um, the same way he got in, in, uh, the attention of Congress back in the 80s when he was like, like, you know, pocketing money for HIV research when he was working for the army. He was, he's a very dodgy character. And I decided that, that I didn't want to make a film about politics, and I felt like he was just a political um, disaster, and that he wasn't functioning in any way that would have merited even criticism for his for whether or not he was doing the right thing, because he was just constantly in there doing the wrong thing. And I felt the same way about Deborah Burks. You know, I felt like I, I couldn't take on. Debbie, <laughs> like she was just, you know, somebody else is going to have to do that and that I was going to try to just stick to the science. And the politics, of course, being that roaring wall of sound in the background, but not dig into the particulars of it. I think we have time for one more question. I, okay, I see two hands, but we'll do the one in the back. No, that's you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, been a lot of talk about sort of low information, sort of population not taking 
the vaccine. And we're talking about sort of problem solving in real time and science literacy, but there's not really even medical literacy that happens in this country. And uh, in, at one hospital in Ohio, six out of 10 of the hospital staff have taken the vaccine. So when you have a discrepancy, even among the frontline health workers about, you know, how to move forward in this sort of fast changing environment, um, I'd like to just ask you guys if you, if that's something that you've heard about or um, if that's something that you'd add to the consideration set for moving forward or considering the next pandemic because it's not just, you know, the, the poor people or the, the people who don't have education. It, it's never been just the poor people or the people who don't have education that are vaccine hesitant. I mean, you look at the measles epidemics here in uh, Los Angeles, they've all been, you know, on the west side of, of, of LA. And, and, and so, I mean, I think, but, but I understand exactly what you're trying to say because there, there is also a very, very important issue related to equity and, being, and, and, and socioeconomic status and all of these other things too. But, but that dynamic plays out in hospitals just as much as it does in schools, just as much as it does in every, every part of society. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a critical issue. And I mean, we're seeing it play out over and over again. I mean, you're the one of all people who probably have the best um, perspective on this. Yeah, in, t in terms of healthcare uh, personnel, unfortunately, this, um, the divide in terms of who wasn't going to get vaccinated, that was highly political. And you, you knew essentially a lot of the politics of people based on that. So if you looked at Illinois, for example, um, like the southern, the southernmost tip of Illinois, which, you know, touching Kentucky, like very Republican, just very Republican. And in those, that, that is, those Southern hospitals were the hardest hit. And they already had the smallest, the fewest number of beds uh, per capita. Uh, and so when people were just like, this is not a real thing, you guys are making such a big deal about it, I don't believe in that vaccine. Like those were the areas where we had to import nurses from all over the, the country at exorbitant rates to go staff the hospitals. And like their own nurses would be patients in the hospital, be on the vent for three weeks before suffering and dying. And people were still like, well, I'm still not getting the vaccine. You know, um, we would in institute like, re try to institute requirements that, okay, if you don't get vaccinated, then you have to test. Like you can, I can test every day. I'm not getting the vaccine. And so I think, because normally healthcare professionals have to get shots. They have to get their, they're, they're required to get the flu shot. They're required to get measles, mumps, rubella, you know, like that's, so that's not been a thing. So it's a little bit unique around this whole politicization of the pandemic, why we had more healthcare professionals than normal not being on board with vaccination, this specific vaccine. Have you seen it change? I'm really curious. Have you seen it change vaccination rates for other vaccines for healthcare professionals as well? Currently? Did so, you have the same problem with the flu vaccine then? Now, all of a sudden, in a way that you may not have in the past or even with your other vaccines like the hep B? And yeah. Other ones? So 20, uh, 20, the first time, you know, we were so worried about, oh my goodness, like if there's going to be a twindemic of the flu and COVID, like everybody gets your flu shot. So people were really into getting their flu shot. And of course we had no flu season at all. Like the flu like wasn't a, wasn't a thing. And, and so 2021, uh, people were just like, oh, you know, whatever. No, I thought you said that the flu shot is only 50% and I'm not even taking the one that's 90%. So like, it, it, it fell off. So there's a big difference between 20 and 21 in terms of flu uptake. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're gonna have to end it there, but I wanna thank all of the panelists and thank you all thank for you, coming. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.